Now, this morning, you can see things look a little bit different from what normally things appear to be here on the platform. And by the way, uh, Mary and I, as we were in Florence, Alabama yesterday, uh, our last week, uh, watched the sermon in the first hour, the celebration service that Patrick Lawrence brought. What a wonderful message that was. And weren't you blessed if you were here on the message dealing with the incarnation of Christ? Thank you so much, my brother. Well, today we're picking another word that we hear a lot of during this time of the year, and that is the word Messiah. And so I'm going to introduce our study, and I'll come back and bring things to a close, and then each point of the sermon today will be shared and brought by one of our three preachers here, uh, Nelson and Tally and Patrick. And so I want you to be praying. This is the first time we've ever tried to get four preachers in in one church service on Sunday morning. So either this is going to go really, really good or really, really bad. I'm not exactly sure which yet, but I'm praying, expecting it's going to be really, really good, and you will be blessed. I want to read for you what the Bible says in Mark chapter 8, verse 29. And he asked them, meaning Christ, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. Did you know that Christ is not Jesus' last name? It's a title. More specifically, it is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Messiah. Now, we hear this word Messiah a lot in church during Christmas time. And we see it a lot on Christmas cards, albeit not as often as we used to. Uh, one might think that this word, being a Jewish word, is not that important. It, it means the anointed one, but that's something of the Jewish part of the Bible. I want to tell you something, my friend. The idea and the truth that Jesus is not a Messiah, but the Messiah, is important for all of us, both Jew and Gentile. Now, the concept of the anointed one first appears in the Bible all the way back in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 28. There we have Jacob, and he had a vision from God. Remember the vision? There was a staircase leading up to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. That was a picture of the Messiah. That was a description of who Jesus is and what Jesus would accomplish. Do you remember when Jesus spoke to Nathaniel and he said that he would see one day heaven opened and that the angels of God would be ascending and descending on the Son of Man? Now, do you remember what the Bible says in Genesis 28 that Jacob did the next morning after that dream? He took the stone that had been his pillow and he placed it as a memorial marker on a pillar. And then he poured oil on that stone. And that is the first picture we have of God uh, using oil anointing in the Bible. But it wasn't the last time that we would see that image. God used it when Moses anointed Aaron as the high priest. We saw it when Samuel anointed David as the king. And we also saw it as Elijah when he anointed Elisha to be the prophet of God. Now, when this took place, it signified purpose and separation. God was calling somebody out, separating them, and in doing, imbuing them with power from on high to accomplish the mission God had given to them. This is what the Bible teaches concerning anointing, but the Bible also teaches in the Old Testament that there was a special anointed one, one different from all of the others who would come. This anointed one, this Messiah, would come from God, and He would be anointed with unlimited power, unlimited measure of the Holy Spirit, and unlimited glory. His anointing would not be temporary. Uh, it would be inexhaustible. It would be everlasting. This would be the eternal anointed one. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the anointed one, he would be able to bear our sins and forgive us of our sins forever and give to us as a gift of grace abundant life now and eternal life forever to all who become his children by believing in him to save them. Did you know that the vast majority of things that we find in the Old Testament deal with Christ as Messiah, the tabernacle, the temple, the offerings, the sacrifices, the Abrahamic covenant, worship psalms, ministries, messages of the prophets, was all about the Messiah promised, personified, and empowered, fulfilled completely in the person of Jesus the Christ the Messiah. The matter of Messiahship of the Lord is fundamental and indistinguishable when it comes to the foundation of a genuine personal faith in Him. Now, in the early church, Christianity was built upon a bold defense that Jesus was what? Messiah. In Acts chapter 9, do you remember what Paul did in his first series of messages after having been converted? He argued with the Jewish rulers, showing them that Jesus is the Messiah. The Bible says proving that Jesus is Messiah. The reason why Matthew begins his gospel with the genealogy of Jesus is to show us that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, he is the fulfillment of everything that Israel was supposed to be. So Jesus was and is the Messiah. The Messiah sent by God. The anointed one of God who was depicted for us as such when Jacob first took the olive oil and poured it out on his stone pillow at a place called Bethel. Well, church family, one thing that I've always wondered is what goes on in the minds of parents when someone come up to them and ask them, can, can I see your baby? Can I hold your baby? I've always wondered about that. Parents, imagine that we were a under normal circumstances, no COVID-19, no fear of COVID-19. And as you came into the church today, taking your child to child care, you see an older gentleman coming up to you with a big old smile on your face, asking you, can I hold your baby? And I'm going to assume in this room that a lot of parents, if you had your coffee, you would probably say yes. So as you give this older gentleman your baby, he lift your baby up, and then he starts to say, Lord, you can take me to heaven now. For my eyes have seen your salvation. My eyes have seen the light to a dark world. My eyes have seen the glory to your chosen people. You can take me to heaven now. Church family, I don't know about you, but if that happens to me in the presence, I am running away. I am literally going the opposite way. But a funny thing is, it did happen. It happened to Mary and Joseph. While they were in the temple fulfilling Jewish laws in Jerusalem, a man named Simeon came in that temple. In Luke chapter 2, verses 27 to 32, we're introduced to a man named Simeon, a devout Jewish man, an older Jewish man who was waiting on the consolation of Israel, who was waiting for the comfort of Israel, who was waiting for the Messiah like most Jews. And when Simeon saw Jesus, he proclaimed and declared that Jesus was the Messiah to the Jews. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 2, verses 27 to 32. It says, And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, 
a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. This is the word of God. Church family, during this time, 400 years has gone by and God has not spoken to his people. 400 good years have gone by and the people of God has not heard from God. They have not heard from God through a prophet. They have not heard from God through an angel. They have not seen any miracles from God. They have not seen any signs from God. It was complete silence. And it is in the silence of God that most people lose their faith. When we feel like God is not answering our prayers, when we feel like God is not listening to us, when we feel like God does not care about what we are going through, that's when we begin to distance ourselves from God. But the way, church family, the way that we interpret the silence of God in the physical world is different from the way they interpret the silence of God in the spiritual world. In the physical world, we think that when God is silent, that means that God is not doing nothing, that he is up to nothing. But in the spiritual world, they know that when God is silent, that means that he is up to something. That means he is about to do something. And Simeon was not supposed to be in a temple that day. He probably had a lot of errands to run. He probably had a lot of things to do around the house. But the Bible said that Simeon was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Simeon knew that God was up to something. So as Simeon went to the temple in Jerusalem and saw Mary and Joseph coming into the temple with Jesus with a big smile on his face, he went up to Mary and said, can I hold your baby? And the Bible said that Mary was puzzled. She didn't know what was going on. But she gave Jesus to Simeon. Simeon lifted Jesus up and said, Lord, my eyes have seen your salvation. My eyes have seen the light to a dark world. My eyes have seen the glory of your chosen people. Simeon recognized the Messiah to the Jews, even in the baby form. And if I was there that day, church family, if I was in a temple that day, I will ask Mr. Simeon, Mr. Simeon, there is so many other babies around. How do you know that is the Messiah? He's just a baby. And Simeon will look at me and say, young man, when you have walked with, walked with God through the bad days and the good days, when you have wrestled with God like Jacob, when you have seen everything around you falling apart, and the only thing you realized that you was holding on to was the promises of God, when you have lived in the presence of God because you realize that that is your true home, then you can recognize God even in the little things. Christians in the world today, we're looking for God to do great things. We're looking for the next great revival, and I'm praying for that too. We're, we're looking for the next Billy Graham, and I'm praying for that too. But church family, if we devote ourselves to the word of God, if we seek the Lord with all of our heart, if we find ourselves on our knees more than on our feet, then we will be able to see God even in the little things. Simeon recognized God even in the baby form. He recognized the Messiah to the Jews, the one who was going to come and not only save Israel, but save the world and fulfill all prophecies. Amen. And so we've seen Messiah as the anointed one, and we have seen Messiah through the eyes of the Jews, particularly Simeon. And now we'll take a look and turn our perspective to the prophets and see how the prophets viewed the Messiah. Now the prophets are a bit of an enigma to us today. Many people believe that the prophets' primary role was to share predictions of future events to those in a particular city or region. But the prophets' true role was to share the truth. Prophets are truth tellers. They share the wisdom, words, and will of God to those that God calls them to share with. 
For many of the prophets, their role was a lonely, exhausting, and a role filled with suffering. Jeremiah, for example, God told him not to marry or have children. Ezekiel lost his wife and then was told not to mourn the loss of his wife. Isaiah, in Jewish tradition, it says that he was sawn in half as a martyr for God. Daniel was taken out of his homeland for his entire adult life under the rule of one of the most brutal and oppressive nations the world has ever known. Despite the trials of their life, they remained faithful to God and continued to speak the truth to others no matter how they were treated, no matter how they were perceived. And so when it comes to their views on Messiah, they shared what God had revealed to each of them. And in sharing the truth of the Messiah, they began to build an expectation for who was coming. Just as you heard from Nelson and just as you heard from Pastor Brian, the Jews began to develop an expectation for what they imagined the Messiah would be like. And so for me, when I hear that word expectations, it reminds me of this little phrase that I sort of live by. Expectations kill joy expectations kill joy. Now, what I mean by this phrase is that if you have grand expectations for a particular moment or situation in your life, then uh, if those expectations, if those grand expectations aren't met, then you could be tragically disappointed by the underwhelming reality of that particular event. And so I seek not to have high expectations for things in my daily life because I don't want to be disappointed. And so for a long time, I did not like Christmas. It never seemed to meet my expectations. I enjoyed time with family. I enjoyed giving gifts and receiving gifts. I enjoyed meditating on the gift that Jesus is to me. But something always seemed off from what I expected. I could never really put my finger on it. And as I, be, as I began to think about it, I realized that Christmas Eve was just the opposite. I didn't place the same expectations on Christmas Eve, but it was always better than Christmas Day. And one day it hit me. Christmas Day ends. There's a tsunami of excitement leading up to Christmas. Christmas secular, and spiritual thrills that prepared the way for this one day, and then it all just seemed to end in an instant. And all the while, I had this deep and heavy expectation in my soul that this one day, this huge moment, would never fade away. And so for the perspective of the prophets, when God revealed his plans for a Messiah to come, surely the prophets had expectations for what this guy would be like. The interesting thing about the prophets is that they only had that small bit of information that God shared with them. You and I have the entirety of the New Testament. We have the Gospels, the story of Jesus Christ and the good news of God's Son come to us. But the prophets, their perspective was merely watching a parade through a knothole in a fence. Each of them was given a small glimpse at the grandness of Jesus Christ. It is only as if they caught that small glimpse of who he would be. And in in terms of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, one of the biggest parades the world knows, it's as if one saw a high school band, another only saw the Clifford balloon, another only saw a dance team, And another only saw Santa. And so let's take a look at what some of these prophets saw through that tiny knothole in the fence that God blessed them with. Isaiah chapter 7, he sees Emmanuel, God with us, born of a virgin. In chapter 9, he sees Messiah as this guy with the government on his shoulders. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. In chapter 53, the Messiah is seen as the suffering servant. This is my favorite chapter in all of Scripture. Jesus, to come, to suffer, to be a servant to us, 
to make many righteous. And then in chapter 61, Isaiah sees the Messiah coming to bring freedom to the captives. In Jeremiah chapter 23, Jeremiah sees the Messiah as the kingly branch of David. In Ezekiel 17, Messiah is illustrated as this massive tree, and all that rest in the tree's shade are blessed. And in chapter 34, Messiah is a shepherd to serve and protect the flock. In Ezekiel 37, Messiah is a redeemer and restorer of life. In Daniel chapter 7, the prophet Daniel portrays Messiah as an everlasting king. In Micah chapter 5, Messiah, he, he's a king to be born in Bethlehem. And in Zechariah chapter 9, Messiah comes as a righteous, humble, and victorious king. Now these are just a few of the prophetic, messianic promises predicted by these prophets. There are many littered throughout the scriptures from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Malachi. The expectation of the prophets was for a God-man made king to come and conquer, restore, and bring prosperity to all that were, was in his kingdom. And their perspective was right on point. Jesus is a conquering king. He does set the captives free. He has given life to the dead. When we see the fullness of Christ in his triumphant parade, no longer from a knot hole in a fence, but from the top of the entire state building, we see so much more. Not only does Jesus fulfill the expectations of the prophets, he exceeds them. Messiah is a life-giving king that came not only to conquer kingdoms, but to conquer hearts, to conquer your hearts, to conquer mine. And so whatever your expectations for Messiah and his birthday are, I hope they are not only met, but I hope that your expectations are exceeded. The prophets were. Christmas Day will come and go, but Jesus is coming again. And his kingdom will never end. So when it comes to Jesus Christ, our Messiah, expectations don't kill joy. Our expectations fill us with a most glorious and everlasting joy, a confident hope. And that's because our Messiah brings glorious, everlasting joy. And so we've seen the perspective of the Jews and we've seen the perspective of the prophets. Now let's turn our attention to the perspective of the disciples. So Tally gave me a perfect transition. We are going to look at the disciples right now, and we're actually going to be in Mark, where Pastor Brian opens, opened us up. But these disciples, they had expectations for who the Messiah was going to be, because they were men steeped in Jewish culture, Jewish tradition, and they knew very well what the prophets had foretold in the coming of the Messiah. In the minds of the disciples, the Messiah was going to be a man of military might. He was going to have dominance in the political sphere. He would establish kingdoms. He would be a man of unmistakable influence. He would be the ultimate nationalist, Israel first, and through that, Jewish custom, law, tradition would be held in high regard. It would be above everything else. But Jesus wasn't in the business of political gain. In fact, some of the people who were most opposed to Jesus were those of high social status, those of political influence. They had socio-cultural influence at their fingertips. And in fact, he even made his intentions quite clear when Jesus says in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. So from the get-go, Jesus the Messiah, he was breaking the mold. And when you read the Gospel of Mark, which is where we're going to be, it's not until eight chapters in when the disciples finally see Jesus, the Messiah, for who he is. Now, leading up to Mark chapter 8, by this point, Jesus has driven out demonic spirits, healed people with diseases, read people's minds and called them out for what they were thinking, healed a paralyzed man, fixed a man's disabled hand, calmed a storm, restored possessed people, raised a girl from the dead, fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, walked on water, 
given a deaf and a mute man hearing and speaking ability, fed 4,000 people with seven loaves and a few fish, given sight to a blind man, among others I didn't list, as well as those that weren't even recorded in the Bible because there were so many miracles that Jesus performed. And yet, his disciples didn't see him for who he was until Mark 8, verses 27 through 29. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. In a parallel verse in Matthew 16, 16, Peter goes further. He says, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. Now, acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah was a necessary and an important step in their relationship, but that didn't mean that they stopped asking questions. That didn't mean that they had all the answers. In fact, their following of Jesus was never marked only by answers. It was marked by faith. And maybe the best place to see that is going all the way back when they first followed Jesus. Mark 1, 16 through 20. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. Now, intellectually, they were still connecting some dots, right? But God doesn't call us to be good and intellectual servants. He calls us to be good and faithful servants. For the disciples, Jesus didn't fit their preconceived narratives or expectations. But yet, they followed. And in doing so, they got to walk with Jesus. Truth is, those who walk closest with Jesus do so by faith. They do so by faith. And Jesus even affirms this in John 20, verses 28 through 29. Now, this is after he's appeared to his disciples. He's speaking with Thomas. Thomas says to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you believed. But blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Jesus is talking about faith. Faithful obedience, not obedience by sight. Faith over experience. Faith over facts. Faith over emotions, faith in Jesus. And we need to understand the disciples were not divine. They were no more human than us. They were no less human than us. And they saw plenty of miracles, but ultimately they followed Jesus because of faith that they had. It was a heart of faith. We see miracles too, by the way. If you want to see a miracle, look around this room. Hundreds of people, dead in their sins, now alive in Christ by the grace of God. That's a miracle. This room is full of miracles. You want to see a miracle? Come to church. There's your miracle. So let faith in Jesus carry you through. For the disciples, Jesus was the Messiah. He was the chosen one, the one who changed everything, the one sent to save. And while they had questions they had an even bigger faith. We can have a bigger faith too. So why do you believe that Jesus is Messiah? Do you believe that he is Messiah because your parents did? Because you've had some amazing experience? Because you have faith? Now all of those things may be true, but the fact of the matter is, those same things can be said about any follower of any false religion you care to name. When it comes to the Christian response, then we say the same thing that Simon Peter said because the testimony of God's Word is clear, sure, and true. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's why I believe He is Messiah because of who he says he is, because of what the Bible says about him. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, 
For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You didn't come to this on your own. You came to this out of the clear understanding of what the Scriptures teach and what God has said. One of the reasons why you and I ought to spend time reading our Bibles, do you want to grow in your faith and confidence of who Christ is as Messiah? Spend time reading His Word. Now, let me ask you a second question. Do you believe He is Messiah? Do you believe He is Messiah? You see, this is inseparable in your understanding of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. He is not a Messiah. He is the Messiah. A young man got wrapped up in a lot of philosophical anti-Christian arguments against the faith while he was in college in one of our nation's major universities, something that happens for so many of our young adults, unfortunately. That's why you ought to pray for our college and young professional ministry called Kainos and those in it. When he confided with his Christian father about his struggle with his faith, he said, Dad, I'm not sure that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, thankfully, let me jump ahead. That young man has since returned to the faith, and he's absolutely convinced and sure of it. But I thought it was interesting that he understood that believing in Jesus is believing in Jesus the Messiah. Not a anointed one, the anointed one. The only anointed one who can forgive us of our sins and give us God's free, indescribable gift of everlasting life. So when we gather to worship Today, this afternoon, this evening, at other times through the season, whether it's at home or at church, whether it's at a quiet time or a dinner table or a church service, understand we worship and praise the one who is the Messiah, that stairwell to heaven, the one who has said about himself, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, which means all who come by Jesus are always welcomed by the Father. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you grateful for that? That He is your Messiah, Christian friend, just as He's mine. But you have to trust in Him and receive Him and believe in Him for Him to be that for you.